You know, after a busy Christmas season, two employees of the Kamloops Recreation Department were scheming to find a way to get time off work. Suddenly, one of the two men lifted up his hand and said, I know how you can get some time off from work. The man quickly looked around. There was no sign of Dennis. And so he jumped up on his desk, kicked up a couple of the ceiling tiles, hoisted himself up, wrapping his legs around a metal pipe as he hung upside down. <laughs> Within seconds, Dennis emerged from his office at the far end of the floor. When he saw the worker hanging up from the ceiling, he asked him what on earth he thought he was doing. I'm a light bulb, answered the employee. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need time off, barked Dennis. Get out of here, that's an order. I don't want to see you back here for at least another two days. <laughs> yes, sir, responded the man as he jumped down, logged off his computer, and headed home. The other employee was also leaving when Dennis intervened and asked, And where do you think you're going? Home, he replied. I can't work in the dark. <laughs> 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 Without a doubt, it is difficult to do anything in the dark. We all would agree with that. Now, whenever there is a power failure in the late evening or night, we will find ourselves rummaging and feeling around to find candles and a flashlight. I keep a fully charged flashlight next to my bedstand just for that particular purpose. But then also there are those occasions when you might get up in the middle of the night. And so without a nightlight, you know, it can be a little bit of a challenging task to find the bathroom in the dark, as well as maybe not tripping over items that have been left on the floor, or maybe a pet that's been stretched out across the carpet. Walking and wandering around in the darkness is hazardous. Now, well, my mother, love bless her soul, she had this insatiable habit that she would like to move her bedroom furniture around every so often. Don't know why, she just did. And one night, my father came home late from work. And so he quietly made his way into the bedroom and to the bed in the dark, only to find himself flopping down on the floor and waking up everybody else in the house. <laughs> You see, Mom had moved the bed, and he wasn't aware of it. And there was also another time which was quite interesting. Mary and I, along with our youngest daughter and our granddaughter at that time, visited an amusement park haunted house. I don't know if you've ever been in one of these. They're quite interesting. So once everybody was in the main room, the doors were closed, and the lights were switched off leaving us in total darkness. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Within seconds, I found myself with my granddaughter lodged up in my arms, her head tucked into my shoulder, our youngest daughter with her arm wrapped around my waist as tight as she could, and Mary hanging onto my arm as we slowly made our way to wherever the door was. And they called this a fun house? <laughs> Well, it was a bit of a relief to get out of that dark place. The prophet Isaiah writes about the relief to be experienced by the northern tribes of Israel, saying, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. In order to understand Matthew's use of these words, we need to understand the historical context in which these words were originally spoken. So the Lord God said to Abram, Go from your country to a land I will show you. Abram went. From Abram would come the twelve sons of Israel, whose descendants would eventually settle the promised land of Kamloops, which had been promised to Abram. So Benjamin and Judah settled in the south, in what would later be called the land of Judah, while the other ten tribes 
Reuben, Simeon, Dan, Naphtali, God, Asher, Isaacar, Zebulun, Manasseh, and Ephraim settled into the north. Maybe the North Shore, I don't know. <laughs> and they became the land of Israel sometime later after King Solomon's death. Now, sad to say, you know, the south remained faithful to King David and to God, while the north turned away from God and worshipped idols until maybe just a few centuries before Jesus' birth, when Samaria returned to God. Although Isaiah prophesied hope for the south, he also spoke of condemnation for the north. Isaiah predicted the northern kingdom would be destroyed by the Assyrians. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the northern tribes had been completely annihilated. And some of you have probably heard it referred to as the ten lost tribes of Israel. Spiritually speaking, the northern kingdom was filled with darkness, distress, and despair. They will become enraged, and looking upwards, will curse their king and their god. Then they will look downward to the earth, and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Isaiah does not paint a pretty picture of the depravity of the northern kingdom. But isn't this the same despair and darkness that is true of sinful humanity today? Who ignore God. Who push the God who desires to have a relationship away in order to chase after and to serve other gods. But the word distress speaks of extreme affliction and discomfort, while thrusting into deep darkness speaks of not being banished and exiled. Leaving Nazareth, writes Matthew, Jesus went and lived in Capernaum, which was in the lake area of Zebulun and Naphtali. <coughs> It's here that Matthew makes the connection with the prophecy of Isaiah, saying, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Now, after John is arrested, Jesus migrates from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, which had originally been the ancient land of Naphtali and Zebulun, in the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, writes the psalmist. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. <coughs> Jesus lights the way for those living in darkness. According to Isaiah, Jesus will move us from gloom and despair into joy and gladness. Jesus will move us from darkness into the light of life. Because in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And so Zebulun and Naphtali were on the northern fringes of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Zebulun was located in a major trade route. And because they were so far north, you know, they really succumbed to the influence of the Canaanites that were still living in the land. You know, they never banished everybody out of the promised land. And so they left a little remnant of people, just enough that enough to cause some influence. Mm -hmm. And in Zebulun's case, they fell into the idolatry and immorality of the Canaanites. Naphtali was actually just a little small little speck of, on the map. And really, they struggled because they were small and because they were near Syria. And so they were being influenced by the neighbors to follow their ways. And so these tribes really being so far away from the center knew only darkness and despair. 
But you know what? They were repeatedly warned to repent and to return to God. But since they had already rejected God, they were the first to feel the wrath of the Assyrians when they attacked from the north. About 200 years after the death of King Solomon, the Assyrians in about the early 8th century conquered Israel and its capital city, Samaria, where they installed their Assyrian gods and their cultic practices. See, the influence of just a tiny bit begins to go through the whole. Afterwards, the Assyrians took the Jewish population of the ten tribes and they shipped them out throughout the entire empire. The idea being that if you put them in different places, they will forget who they originally were and they will become like those where they're living. And as such, these northern regions would become predominantly non-Jewish. It's in the shadow of this devastation by Assyria that Isaiah, writing roughly the mid-8th century, brings a message of future hope. As Isaiah prophesies that a time is coming when despair will be replaced with light and joy in the Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, there is some controversy among scholars as to whether or not Isaiah actually uses the specific Hebrew words, Galilee of the Gentiles, some 700 years before Jesus' birth. Now, most people are in full agreement that Matthew is making reference to the prophet Isaiah. While some believe that Isaiah is making reference to a historical event which took place before the Assyrian conquest, possibly as far back as during the time of the reign of King Solomon, which sadly places Naphtali and Zebulun in an even darker light. Hiram, king of Tyre, which is located on the Mediterranean Sea, just outside of Asher, which is next to Naphtali, had supplied cedar, cypress, and gold to Solomon so that he could build the temple. To repay him, King Solomon gave 20 towns in Galilee to Hiram, king of Tyre. When Hiram went out to Tyre to see the town Solomon had given him, he was not pleased with them. And he called them the land of Kabul, which translates to mean the land of good for nothing. <laughs> Literally, in Hebrew. These northern provinces, which bordered the Mediterranean Sea and Lake Genesera, now they would see a great deal of foreign trade and influence. But after the Assyrian conquest, the culture, the religious, the life of these northern tribes would be changed drastically. You know, any Orthodox Jew who would have been able to would have escaped to the south and settled in Judea. For the 600 years which would have followed the Assyrian conquest, the population of the north would have been predominantly Gentile, Syrians, Canaanites, Samaritans, Phoenician farmers. Until, of course, the Greeks come along and they conquer Assyria and they take over. And then, of course, after that, the Greeks are conquered by the Roman Empire. And you know, when we look at this history, it's not hard to understand why the Jews, who concentrated all their efforts into the south and on the rebuilding of Jerusalem and Judea, after the exiles returned from Babylon, despised their northern cousins. The northern kingdom to them was not Jewish. And really, the northern kingdom had even allied itself with Syria at one time, which was east of Naphtali, in order to attack the southern kingdom. So we have brothers attacking brothers. Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramilia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem and besieged Ahaz, but they could not overpower him. Imagine, these northern tribes were going after the southern tribes. 
So these northern regions where we now find Jesus had truly become the Galilee of the Gentiles, which could also be translated the region of the nations. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. History demonstrates that the northern kingdom of Israel had been living in deep darkness for millennia. But the prophet Isaiah speaks a word of hope to these northern tribes. Eight centuries before the incarnation of Christ into the human world, but why is this word of compassion, of healing, and of hope directed at Israel instead of at Judah? Now, notice that God enters our really messed up dark world through the incarnation in Bethlehem of Judea. The angel said, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. And then afterwards he declares peace on the earth. Now Jesus lights up the way for those living in darkness, moving them into the light of life. Jesus brings peace. As Jesus came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. But Jesus' birth takes place in the southern kingdom, where an evil and jealous King Herod attempts to have the Christ child killed, forcing Jesus and his family into Egypt until the death of Herod. And then, a je jealous and spiteful religious leadership of Judea would later arrest Jesus secretly and hand him over to Pilate with the accusation that Jesus called himself a king. Now, after hearing that John had been arrested, Jesus leaves the southern districts and seeks the safety of the non-Jewish north. The southern kingdom is just simply not safe for Jesus, and he knows that when the time is right, he will have to return to Jerusalem and to the temple of God. But right now is just not the time. So instead, Jesus returns home to Nazareth. Isaiah prophesies how the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now, those walking in darkness don't know about God. They don't know anything about God's salvation. We see them around us all the time, even today. And it's in this land of the Gentiles which Jesus first brings the light of life. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome. King Solomon would instruct his children, saying, The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. The people who have been walking in darkness for centuries are in for a big surprise, because all of a sudden a great light will appear and shine into their deep darkness. Now Isaiah even warns of this great epiphany when he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. You know, we can't find the light ourselves. So the light always comes to us. So Jesus withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. Nazareth, in the region of Zebulun, is where Mary and Joseph would settle and raise Jesus when they returned from Egypt. But Nazareth had a reputation. You know, when Philip was following Jesus, 
he found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, <coughs> Jesus of Nazareth. To which Nathanael replies, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? You know, Jesus would leave Nazareth because he had no honor in his hometown. In fact, the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard what Jesus said. And so they got up, drove him out of the town, <coughs> took him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. So the fishing village of Capernaum was located in the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, in the land of Naphtali, and had a population of about 1,500 people at that time. It appeared to have a healthy Jewish presence and synagogues. It was the hometown of our tax collector friend called Levi, and it was close to the village of Bethsaida, the hometown of Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John. The fact that Jesus' ministry would originate in the northern provinces of Naphtali and Zebulun would also become a stumbling block to the Jewish leadership, who would later proclaim to Nicodemus, Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. But Jesus had come from this region of Israel in order to fulfill scripture and the proof to reveal himself as the long expected Messiah. The fulfillment of the scripture is simply another epiphany as Christ is manifested in our human world by adhering to what has already been written about him in the word of God. And since, you know, we all dwell in the land of deep darkness and in the shadow of death, we all need the light of Christ to shine in our lives. You know, a little boy heard in his Sunday school class one day that Jesus was the light of the world. After class, he went up to his teacher and he said, if Jesus is really the light of the world, I wish he'd come and hang out at my house. It's awfully dark where I live. Jesus says, I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Amen. To him be all glory. Amen.